but also the beauty of the place. So we're going to be jumping in today and talking about, about a few different topics, but mostly about the people that live in this region. So um, everybody always asks, what is this about? Uh, we're on day three of the uh, inaugural binational summit of Laguna Salada and Salt Sea Restoration. So just quickly, uh, while uh, we're here, I'm going to try and um, share a little bit of the context and, and the reason for the meeting. So uh, the reason why we stepped in here today and we're, why we're doing this summit is, um, is to share um, why restoration is important, why um, doing development in a region like this with the community and for the community is more important than an overlay and uh, us trying to implement a project uh, independently of all of the people that you've seen over the last few days and the people that you, you're going to see here today. It really takes a collaboration effort and us as a professional project management team, um, that's where we really have to be kind of the organizer of not only events like this, but also the project. You know, we want to bring the brightest minds from the, the technical aspects to also um, the, the stakeholders that are in the region and then also the education components. So with that being said, we're gonna we're gonna have lots of different speakers today, some of the local tribal members. We're gonna jump into that conversation and try and share at least some of their their needs for the region uh you know in, in times of covid like we see here there's there's lots of different necessities part of that's food right a lot of us just need simple simple basic things like food to be able to survive and and some of the opportunities that we have in this region are to create ocean water farming like we heard from christian yesterday um, and there's lots of other opportunities for dry agriculture in the region but most of all, it just creates a habitat and is a backup plan for the Salton Sea. So quickly, I'm going to share uh, my screen real quick just to give everybody that isn't familiar with the discussion that we're having an overview and um, jump right in. Um, this was given a, on our first day, uh, but we have a few minutes before we start with our speakers. So let's just um, kind of share a little bit of what the project is. And I know we did an overlay of a line here, but this is an artificial line at the border, right? The border is kind of a predetermined line. Uh, in the past, this was all uh, Kumeyaay land. Um, this was all Lake Kauia, and the tribal natives uh, would come from San Diego and uh, come down to Lake Kauia, um, and they would do this yearly migration back and forth to the coast uh, and, and down to Lake Kauia, and it was uh, this procession uh, per se, but there was no lines. This was all. This was all one region. This was all one land, and it has deep-rooted history. And so, what this project is encompassing is, uh, we're praying for for water. We're praying for um, restoration, and we're trying to do that with the indigenous elders and and community members and representatives and nonprofits in the region. And we really want to have a, a cumulative project that benefits them and benefits all of the others that are in the region, the farmers, the other underlying property owners, uh, but also the people of Mexicali that are looking for new econo economic opportunities. Uh, this could be a project that creates the, the renewable energy benefit for the region um, and on both sides of the border, but also creates uh, needs for making that more sustainable with pumped hydroelectric storage. So there's a lot of different avenues and opportunities and add-ons once we're able to bring in water. So we're looking, um, as discussed, Trace Lagunas is a larger version of the three three lagoons within Mexicali, which is where we got the uh, concept from, uh, just on a larger scale. Um, the restoration and remediation of places like the Trace Lagunas within Mexicali and uh, so eloquently described uh, by Mr. Zamora yesterday with the Sonoran Institute is a way to build community uh, engagement. It's a way to build uh, empowerment of the local local uh, people that inhabit the region. But most of all, this is a health, life, and safety concern. And, you know, I, I put a lot of importance on that because people's lives are in the balance and, and the fish and the bird species are really waning. And we have to take that very seriously. That in and of itself, that's why we have 
uh, the Endangered Species Act. These birds need to be protected and it's our jobs as stewards to protect them. And that really brings us to the, the next discussion that we're gonna launch, which is stewardship of the environment. There is a way to take care of the environment and there's a way to use science as a guiding principle and use the highest best, best technology that we've been able to develop as a species to help the land, help the water, help the people, and um, not just uh, certain elite groups of people. We, we want to help all the people, and that includes the most impoverished. Uh, Imperial County is one of the most impoverished in the United States, uh, second to uh, West Virginia and, and places that are um, really adversely affected by uh, extraction type of uh, mentality. Um, we really want to be stewards for, for the land and the water, as I mentioned but for every living thing, uh, because uh, as my friend <laughs> prepped me uh, and, and shared with me before I started this summit, uh, Ochi Maka is uh, we are <clears throat> we are a part and we are connected to all that is ever, ever was, right? I, I am connected to all that ever was. And that's really important because we have that um, ability to, to help and we have that responsibility to help. So let's just go through some of the technology, some of the uh, concepts real quick to give everybody that hasn't been uh, able to participate over the last couple of days uh, an introduction. Uh, we're really excited. Salton Sea, Laguna Salada, and the Sea of Cortez Restoration. Uh, we have the inaugural binational summit talking about the Colorado River Basin, climate mitigation and management strategies. We're talking about several states and several countries here. So we're excited to have everybody come in. Uh, the renewable energy opportunities that are expanding along here are many and uh, you know they're not limited to just the infrastructure they're they can expand to seawater farming to um, to ocean ocean water agriculture and just ocean water landscape in general to start to enhance and uh, prolong the North American monsoon so we have the scientific studies that were talked about yesterday by uh, Dr. Mitchell and uh, Dr. Branch, um, regional climate models are a very important part of the conversation. Uh, we have ways and means to restore the Southwest of the United States and uh, into, the, into the Midwest. Um, and these are global climate change restoration strategies. So that's why we're excited to have this event, to bring everybody to the table, to have all the stakeholders' voices heard. And that's what we're doing here today. Uh, salt and sea restoration can happen in parallel. Uh, we can also restore the endangered habitat that is um, the Northern Sea of Cortez and the Gulf of California, which is currently having uh, issues with salinity rise. Uh, by bringing water into Laguna Salada, we can, we can circulate water back around more efficiently. And that's the approach that we're taking is professional project management and using science as our guiding principle. But these are also low cost solutions. You know, when we're talking about these restoration opportunities, the basis of this right here is, you know, 500 to 600 million dollars and you get a whole lake. It's almost equal to the size of the Salton Sea, but most importantly, it has uh, the equal amount of evaporation that the Salton Sea has as it can restore the Colorado River Basin. So we have high tidal ranges that come in from uh, the Sea of Cortez that can push water into Laguna Salada and back around without additional energy needs. And we have the ability to bring water within the seven miles of the US-Mexico border, which is pretty amazing. Uh, we can bring water down to the Salton Sea, which is near ocean water quality. And we could have uh, that infrastructure generate a lot of renewable energy. So it becomes a you know plus or minus $1 billion project in lieu of 33 to $70 billion in, in action. And that kind of is the context of a global global impetus for needing to do climate change mitigation and management. The cost of inactions are too severe not to do something. Uh, we have all these other opportunities for cleaning up the water with uh, phytoremediation and phytomining. If you uh, weren't able to participate in day two, we had many of the specialists and scientists and engineers that have those technologies for floating islands, but also um, uh, land applications for plant species that can clean up a lot of heavy and disgusting water quality issues such as selenium that uh, starts to mutate birds and fish and uh, it becomes an economic opportunity and a green job creation. So 
you know, the real gist of this summit is to talk about renewable energy. It's to talk about job creation, which is really important um, in, in this time of COVID. Every country, every nation around the world is suffering from economic depression, uh, some more than others, some extremely impoverished now, and, and they were before everything happened. Um, I was really hopeful, and I shouldn't say hopeful, but I was hopeful when I heard that COVID kind of stopped. It stopped the world, right? Or maybe it just kind of veiled the world a little bit, but I was hopeful in that time we would come out on the other side as working together as treating everybody as equal and having equal opportunities, not only in the economic um, context, but you know, just treating other people as equals um, in, in every other sense of the, the concept. You know, looking back to our indigenous elders, you know, everybody was equal. Everybody had a fair share at the table. Everybody had an equal vote. Everybody shared what they had with others, so that everybody could benefit. And that's been a real inspiration and a driving force and developing this project is that it's not just to the benefit of us. It's not just to the benefit of our engineering partners, uh, both economically, but it's about putting in projects that make economic sense. They make uh, scientific sense. And we're using that to, to drive the opportunities. Um, developing wind projects here, developing ocean water farming, developing solar farming, uh, waste conversion energy, pumped hydroelectric storage. There's an infinite number of add-ons that benefit the local regions in both sides of the border. We can connect to the Sunrise Power Grid and deliver renewable energy to not only TJ, but San Diego, as well as Imperial County and Mexicali. And that becomes a public-private partnership that we've been developing over many years. Uh, you have to bring the, the science to um, be a guiding principle. Um, so that's kind of a brief introduction for those that are listening online that might not have been familiar um, and might not have been able to participate uh, over the last few days. We have it on YouTube, um, so you can check out our YouTube channel and kind of get up, up to date. There were seven hours, eight hours of entertainment, <laughs> but um, we wanted to make it fun and we wanted to make it entertaining and we wanted to make it an experience that people can look back to and, and try and have a way to understand that this is a template. This is a template for climate change mitigation and management as a whole. You have to use science. You have to have uh, a collaboration that's multifaceted and it doesn't just become one person, one idea. It's all of us putting our ideas at the table. So I'm really excited to share with you today. I'm gonna get our agenda up so we can go over that briefly and tell you how excited I am because we have an amazing group of individuals coming in today. Let me get that up on the screen for everybody and then we'll jump right in. So feel free to put any questions in the chat. We're monitoring our Facebook account too if you have any questions there. YouTube, we, we disabled the chat function because we wanna make this available for kids. Want to make this an education opportunity for our youth because they're the really uh, they're the driving force in making these projects successful. So today we're going to start. We saw that um, video from uh, Caesar Omar Perez. Uh, we'll have that available for people to uh, participate in and uh, experience um, that content. We're going to try and share some of the other artists' uh, information too. Uh, we're going to uh, introduce um, starting here in a second. Uh, the Caesar Beltran, he is the um, Kukupa tribal member. He's the um, current mayor of the Kukupa tribe. And um, we're gonna introduce um, a good friend of mine and coworker, who are the founders of the Native American Church of Turtle Island, uh, NACTI, and he's the president and co-founder, David Gaskin. And uh, we'll introduce him and his efforts. Uh, hopefully we can get Juan Gonzalo Moreno on the uh, line too. He actually, was an inspiration for us to work directly with the tribe on this project. He contacted me after a presentation with Imperial County um, that talked about water import. And Juan Gonzalo has been a driving force in trying to get uh, the discussion made whole for, for bringing this um, forward and introducing us to our engineering partner, Mr. Alan Dennis, introducing us to different political officials in the region. And then hopefully we can get Alan Hatcher on the line too that can join us, uh, who's a Kumeyaay member. Um, and then I've also invited um, Mr. Uh, Thomas Tortes of the Torres Martinez tribe. I didn't wanna um, put them on the agenda just so uh, you know if they weren't able to make it, um, 
you know, that, that would be okay. Uh, Tare from uh, Bombay Beach, we heard him yesterday. He's going to join us again over a lunch break. And then we're going to go into water treatment, um, Blue Boson. And uh, Alan uh, Bloom is going to join us. He also does the nano uh, resonance industries, uh, interesting water treatment technology. Uh, one of the, the big speakers that was able to join our team today, which we're really grateful and thankful for, from Versus Lab and the Spatial Web Foundation, we have Dan Mapes, uh, tracking, tracing, quantification, you know, integration into you know internet and the new internet, which is going to be just an amazing part of this conversation. Later on, we're going to talk about green infrastructure implementation and just kind of an overall policy discussion. So hopefully, we can have some political officials on both sides of the border join us. And then we're going to have uh, the Church of Music wasn't able to join us yesterday they're going to join us for our art and music event uh, but we'll have a wrap-up discussion with our team so let's get started um, let me join back in here stop share so we have a couple uh, Antonio you're here do you want to you want to get started let's put you up on the screen sorry sure Nathan how are you, how are you doing today uh, great thank you for this opportunity and hello to everyone good morning my name is Cesar Antonio Beltran Badilla. Right now, I'm the president and representative of the Cucapa community in Mexicali, which is the uh, La Comunidad del Mayor Indígena Cucapa. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here, and especially to Nathan White for this opportunity about this project. Um, uh, right now, uh, we have uh, full knowledge of this project because we have been working on it uh, from the, uh, for at least uh, five years. Uh, this project is of really importance for the community because it will help not just the Cocopa community, but also both Mexicali, uh, Baja California, the state of California and the Salton Sea. It's a really interesting project. It's a project that we should take, that we should all uh, take in consideration and give it the importance that it is because it, hell, it, it will improve our environment. It will improve our communities. And especially talking about the Cocopa community, it will help to prevail or, or, or save uh, for the next generations, oral customs, oral, uh, 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 oral fault traditions, because right now we're, we're uh, going through a really rough path when it comes to, to an economic due, to, due through COVID-19. We are all, not just as a tribe, but, but as a nation, and going through this really, really bad uh, process in life. And these type of projects will bring uh, together uh, two countries, will bring together different uh, people and different communities. Um, I'm really glad that people uh, like Nathan are, are having a genuine concern and, 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 and work and deal on these type of projects because we'll give the community uh, the Cocopa community, uh, different opportunities. These opportunities come uh, with work, with uh, compromise, and with a lot of really positive results. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. Um, sorry, the, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry for, for, for the inconvenience right now. Uh, if any questions, uh, I, I'll be open for them. Just to let you know, the Cocopa community is one of the native communities here in the state of Baja California. We have been here even before the the Spanish uh, people, the, the Spaniards came to to the to Mexico. And in all of, of our of our traditions and customs, uh, fishing is one of them. Agriculture is one of them. And these type of projects will help prevail and, and maintain these type of customs and traditions. Uh, these programs, which need to be worked hand by hand and taken in consideration the Cocopa, the Cocopa community is of real importance because one of the main courses uh, 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 of the water that's going to be needed 
to do all this comes and goes through at least half of, of the Cocopa uh, community land. And we are more than, than, than excited and, and honorable to be taken in consideration for this project. And we would like to, to, to work hand, uh, hand by hand with this type of project and, and, and make, it, make it real. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for joining us. It's actually a real honor that you were able to step in uh, and start this conversation because, you know, your your team, both you and uh, Juan Gonzalo, you, you were at the forefront of actually coming to us and us coming to you to start the collaboration. And that was the most important part in, in me personally that said this project is real. The people want this project and it's not just an idea it's actually moving the conversation forward so that was an important part where i started devoting full-time efforts into how feasible what engineering is needed what needing meetings need to take place and since then you know we've given a presentation at the polytechnical university of baja california they're predominantly interested and supportive of the Kukapa tribe and providing an education opportunity for their students, but also for tribal members. So that becomes a place where not only your ancestral fishing and your ancestral farming can come into place, but new farming can come into place. And that was talked about yesterday with the seawater agriculture. There's new opportunities that I'm sure 100% of your tribal members would be more than excited to learn new ways of farming and new systems as well that's right that's right nathan um we had, had several meetings with the uh, universidad politecnica with uabc with cobash with cecite which are all educational organisms here in, in 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 the community here in the city and all of them are putting their part in when it comes to develop uh, academic programs, economic programs, and sustainable projects, both in the fishing uh, branch and in the agriculture branch, which are pillars and are the base of our traditions and customs as, na as, as one of the most recognized native communities in the state. Um, and especially because of the program where all these, I'm sorry, and especially because of the location of this project, uh, we are excited to be part of because it goes through our land. I think in about maybe 40% of the trajectory of the project is in our land. And we are really, really interested in being able to, to, to look at this project of saving the Salton Sea with people like you and other and other pe uh, people interested in the project to make it real. Uh, we are, how can I say it? We, everyone is in this, in, is in, we are in the same boat when it comes to the environmental uh, difficulties we, we can see if the Salton Sea doesn't take care of. I mean, there's a lot of, of things that come when the water goes low in the Salton Sea, dust, pollution, diseases, and we are neighbors. It will come and, and also affect us. And what, what else, or I mean, I see the benefit of this binational project that will come that will bring together countries and that will also bring together communities and people who are genuinely interested in prevailing and saving our, our, our seas and our, and our, and our planet. It, it, well, that's what has to happen at a, at a community scale, at a, at a state level and at a federal level and at a global level. There's, there's no chance that any project or any effort is successful if it's not done in cooperation and in collaboration with all of those interested. And it's really interesting when you, when you have, and like when you have a, a consciousness that everybody is working in the same direction and everybody is 
has that same mentality of the solutions and, and the, the vision of collaboration that that's when projects actually start to happen just with our collective en energy that's created, right? Exactly, exactly. When people come together, when it's the same interest, interests, especially when it comes to positive interest, um, sustainable interest, and trying to maintain uh, a native culture. When all that, all when all, all those points come together, I think we can say we have a really, really good project, and especially that we have a project that will make a difference that will last for generations. Absolutely, yeah, and and just that context of building bridges, right? There's been over the last many years, I wouldn't say four years, but I would say many generations, um, that separation of the border mentality. Um, me growing up in Cathedral City, it was always interesting because you know we have a very cross-pollinated culture in the desert in Coachella Valley. It, you know, it's not as uh, diverse, I would say, as Indio, but it's not on the other spectrum of Palm Springs. So Cathedral City was this very interesting in-between. So I would kind of almost equate Cathedral City to the border itself, the line, right, in between, you know, the communities of India, which are heavily farming communities, and the affluent Palm Springs community. So we were that border line, and it's that interesting bridge in between that we're talking about today. Uh, that that border is artificial, and and this project really creates a zone. It creates a green economic zone, but it creates a, a uh, more than that, a geopolitical collaboration zone. And that's what really builds us out of our current depression is uh, green projects in the region, but just a cost benefit analysis. Uh, you, you mentioned briefly, and I want to touch on that. It's not just an issue. If the Salton Sea is drying, it's not just going to kill people or adversely affect them in El Centro. It's going to affect people in Mexicali. It's going to affect and vice versa. The Laguna Salada lake bed also has dust when below, you know when dust kicks north from the Santa Anas that goes north to El Centro so you know dust that comes from San Diego comes from the west to the east and south right there's there's no way that you can just stick the Salton Sea on a pedestal and talk only about it because there's so many other multiple factors that come into play uh sure as I also mentioned before we are all in the same boat we are neighbors, and when it comes to uh, mutual benefit, both for for us and for the coming generations, uh, we need to take care of it, and we need to to take action when it comes to to prevailing and maintaining our our, our, our community, our traditions, and in this case, our environment and our planet. You know, it was really interesting to me when I visited Mexicali for the, the meetings that we had there and our civil engineer is the, the ingrained Chinese culture that's in the region, too. So you have this really interesting pollination of not only native communities and tribal communities in Mexicali and Mexico, but you have this Chinese uh, community that's there as well, mixed in with those people that come from around the world. You have German and you have all different cultures in that region can you talk a little bit about that just kind of the diversity oh well yeah when it comes to diversity um what i can tell you about it is that uh, mexicali which is where, where where i'm from uh it's composed by people from many regions uh from mexico especially from the state of sonora the state of sinaloa uh, and the state of jalisco uh, besides that, when Mex Mexicali was start growing as a city, uh, we had a lot of Chinese immigrants that came to Mexico to work on the railroads. That's why it's called Mexicali. Mexicali, it's the combination of two words, which is Mexico and California. In Calexico, which is a neighbor city in the border, next to the border in the state of California, is the mixture from California and Mexico. That's why it's called Calexico. That's why we are uh, uh, sister cities, and when 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 it come when it came to the uh, growing and development of the city, a lot of Chinese uh, uh, people came 
to work uh, on the railroads to establish and actually to make the city grow. Uh, when it comes to diversity, international diversity, that's where actually Mexicali uh, came to, to grow as a city. Well, a lot of people can say that our typical food in the city is Chinese food, which is one of the best around Mexico, I can tell you that. And besides that, we have other other immigrants in the state uh, from Russia, for example. And also we have a lot of other native uh, Indian communities like the Pai Pai, like the Kumiai, and uh, also other native communities from the inner part of Mexico, like the Purepeches. Uh, therefore, Mexicali, when it comes to uh, diversity, uh, we are full of people from all over Mexico, uh, from China and other native communities. And somebody dropped a question in here. Maybe we can talk about that. Can you talk about how your people are divided by the border? And I think you just mentioned that, but you know, the border line itself. I know Gonzalo. Uh, you know, we were trying really hard to you know apply for you know positions for him within our company in the United States. That process is so convoluted. But tell tell us about uh, that just briefly. You know, the process of how how that could be easier or how that division has created a uh, difficulty for your your travel well when it comes when it comes to like uh, border breach or like uh, division when it comes to, to international boundaries I think that either it applies in a minor way because uh, for my understanding and I, and I, and I have and I prove of it the consulate of Mexico in California takes a lot of consideration when it comes to the Cocopas. Uh, there's actually uh, Cocopa members in Yuma, Arizona. And although we have a border, when it comes to the vision, it, we try to, to uh, take it to uh, the minimum as possible because we, we are really organized when it comes to uh, as a tribe. And they really give us our, our, our position, if you can put it in our way, or they really recognize the fact that we are a native community here in, in, in Mexicali. And, and that's it. Excellent. Yeah, that's, I think that kind of ties in to, you know, the connectivity north of the border, like you said, Kumeyaay Nations. I, I think a great conversation that we're starting is how everybody works together, right? It's because it's not just a, a tribal nation collaborating with one other tribal nation. And we're going to get into that work that uh, both myself and David have been doing to create a nonprofit church. that can be a culmination of all of those things, but it is really the, the conversation that is not just one nation with another nation, one one side of the border with the other, it's everybody working together. So tell us a little bit about what you think that might be like in the future when, when there's a connectivity but between all native groups. But I mean, this is, I guess, ubiquitous on the political side, right? We've gone so far, we're almost at a 50-50 split in the United States, right? Like, not to talk about that too much, but where, how do we get there? Where, where can we re return back to that? Because we are all one people. We are all Americans. You're all, you know, uh, uh, Mexican on, on that side of the border, but we're, we're all people. So maybe we talk about uh, what happens. We've gotten to this point of division almost in half and, and what happens after that. I kind of envision projects like be this being the impetus for everybody working together. Oh, well, now now that you mention it, uh, it has been, it has been clear to us as a native community that, for example, in, in the United States, they give a little bit of an import, uh, a little bit of a more important role to native communities. Mexico, on the other hand, is starting to give a lot more of attention, a lot more of attention and and, and importance to native communities. Um, from let's say about a year ago or two ago, when it comes to a politically, uh, they're taking more consideration. They're taking the native communities are, are are playing a bigger role when it comes to to recognition and to respect. And these type of projects 
may impulse or may push uh, for better ways of support, recognition, respect, and honor to many other native communities. Uh, we are uh, we are in progress and in, in working for that support and recognition. I, I, I will have to excuse myself in case I have some technical difficulties, uh, but so far I think we are working and having progress in that uh, specific subject, which is uh, better support, more recognition, and way more interest in native communities here in Mexico. Absolutely, because, you know, having a seat at the table is equally as important as having a vote, right? Um, and and I, I am really excited. I mean, everybody might know or might have heard that uh, Deb Holland was just, uh, you know, appointed uh, as Secretary of the Interior. That's like a first in, in our history, uh, not only a woman, but a Native woman to, to that agency. I think that paradigm shift is, is interesting for many different reasons. But it, it tells it tells everybody that there's an importance in uh, the value structure that that not only she brings, but uh, that that all native groups bring to the, the discourse of policy, politics, and land management. So maybe maybe talk briefly about that land management because I know you know your group is within a community in Mexicali, I think southwest of Mexicali. But overall land management, this this idea kind of came about through just looking at the historic shoreline of Laguna Salada and then the idea of how that was used over the last, you know, hundred or thousands of years. When I looked at it, that was the only viable solution is to restore that to its historic shoreline, right? We can't make it bigger, but at least uh, in its present stance, restoration as a principle. Right, and it's not just mitigation. That that strategy comes about in the political discussion. Mitigation of dust is not restoration. So, talk to us a little bit about land management and uh, restoration as a principle. Oh well, when it comes to land management, I can, what I can tell you, Nathan, is that we, as a community, uh, we have the legal uh, right and possession to a hundred. 143,000 hectares, which is almost like two, I mean, I mean almost 300,000 acres of land south of the Laguna Salada and south of the Sierra Cucapa, which is the Cucapa Mountains, um, which is what was given to us the, uh, on a presidential uh, decree. And, and and, and when it comes also to, to kind of like a restoration of, of the land, what I can tell you is that we'll help the community, we will be both beneficial, and we have the means when it comes to land ownership to do that, and also we'll, have, we'll help the environment when it comes to land management, if, if, I, understand, if I understood correctly your, 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 your question. Um, uh, also will will be really, really appropriate for us to participate in this type of project or any other project that helps the Laguna Salada and help the community, the Cocopa community to maintain a really uh, sustainable environment. Right, so it's, it's not just, I mean, our goal is getting people to funding assistance that they need, right? That if your tribal community is, you know, able to, you know, collaborate with land that is under your stewardship, that should be uh, compensated economically, but it's more than that. Can you describe that? Because not, not only would each tribal member benefit from, you know, a land lease or something of that sort or a land partnership or collaboration, but tell us it, it's more than that because it's a not only an economic opportunity, it is an environmental restoration opportunity, which is the land and the water, which, you know, Western uh, culture doesn't monetize environmental restoration now, but I think we're starting that discourse of habitat restoration, habitat creation should have an economic 
value to it. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Well, he might have dropped out. We might have had some some uh, connection issues here. 